Okay. Thank you, everybody, for being here today. A uh, warm welcome to you here at the State Library and to those people who are also uh, zooming in from right around the state. Thank you very much for being here with us. Uh, this is the Alliance's major event for the year, our annual Alliance member meeting, briefly this morning, and then our Workforce Strategy Summit, where we're going to launch the Workforce Strategy. Uh, I'm Emma Griffiths, I'm the Director of Advocacy and Communications at the Alliance, and um, just to uh, guide you to your packs, if you're in the room, you have the QR code which will take you through to the actual strategy. Uh, we didn't want to print it out, another document, you know, chew up some more trees, but um, it's, it's there for you to look through as we go through it th through this morning. And if you're online as well, an email has been sent to people who registered online yesterday and you will also have the workforce strategy, the core competency framework. Um, you'll also have the slide pack so you can make yourself feel like you're really in the room. And um, if I could just ask that you keep your mobiles on silent uh, while you're in this room. And um, I would now, uh, well, I'm honoured to introduce New Knuckle Yagura to welcome us to country. Uh, Yeri Rangambele, Gramba Bigi Yagara Dagan. Hello and welcome. Good morning to Yagara Country. Yagara Country, which we're all gathered upon here today, stretches from the mouth of the Brisbane River out to the Great Dividing Ranges, just at the foothills of the Warwick and the Toowoomba Range, back down south to the Logan River, and as far north as the Pine River. Now, within the Yagara Country, we have several sub clans. For example, we have the Turrbal to the north, the Yugurupul to the west and the Gurumpul to the east. I've been asked to come give you a welcome to country today on behalf of the local traditional owners. And welcome to countries aren't something that Aboriginal people and event organisers have come up with over time. It's something that we've been doing since the start of time. Now, there are many forms to a welcome to country. Firstly, we have the handing over of the message stick, which we call a Yalwa Buna. Now, on this Yalwa Buna will be a small marking or a carving to depict the reason why you're wanting to travel through someone else's country. Another form of a welcome to country is the smoking ceremony. For example, when neighbouring tribes were to visit our country, we'd actually take them through a smoking ceremony. We believe the smoke produced from our special bloodwood trees actually rids bad spirits and negative energies that may be following them. Now lastly, a form of welcome to country where a traditional owner or an elder would come out and welcome you here and I'd like to do that by saying yiri yiri ngambele, yinanga niri bajara, nanya mingyudu, nanya birli, nanya baya mijara. Now it simply means you are welcome to gather on this country and may God and all of our ancestors with us guide us here in peace. Nanya and thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name's Melanie Sennett. I'm the Acting Chair for Queensland Alliance of Mental Health. Um, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we are on, the Turrbal and Yugara people, and I would like to pay my respect to Elders past, present and emerging and pay my respects to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders people here today. So, if you work in community mental health, I have a question for you. Why? Why do you do the work that you do? What is it that gets you out of bed and spend most of your time at your job? I was asked this question recently and actually I didn't have to think very hard. I'm the CEO of Stepping Stone Clubhouse in Brisbane. I walked through the front doors for the first time nearly 28 years ago. 22 year old me did not realise that she'd walk through the doors of the place that she'd spend her work, adult working life. And it didn't take me long to think about why I love the work that I do. The reason I loved it back then is still the reason that I love it today. And that reason is because we are people-based. Every aspect of what we do is with members in a partnership. So those who are accessing the service are also planning, delivering and evaluating the service. For me, this just makes sense. 
I believe it's actually crucial in any organisation, not just mental health. It just seems so simple. This person-centred approach is at the heart of the mental health community sector. I love where I work because of the members who say to me that this place that I work has given them a purpose, a job, a home, a community. And it's because of those members who have said that it has saved their life. While my reasons for being in the sector will always outweigh the challenges, I feel it's important to acknowledge that things can be difficult. Being part of a community mental health NGO can actually be lonely. We are often competing for a small pool of funding. We operate our services with small budgets for amazing outcomes. Long-term financial planning is almost impossible due to the length of service agreements and the ever-changing length of the funding landscape. And with the NDIS review, it looks like we're about to go through another major change. As a result, our sector is really busy and there is little time to connect. The Queensland Alliance helps to bring our sector together to provide a voice for NGOs. And we did this just this week, meeting with the Minister for Health and Mental Health, Shannon Fentiman. Um, and we are explaining to her some of the real impacts of our work and also the funding difficulties. We felt we got a good hearing, so hopefully there might be some positive news to come. Woo. Woo. <laughs> a major focus for Queensland Alliance this year has been the community mental health and wellbeing workforce strategy. This strategy looks at what is required to address the workforce challenges in this sector and how exciting to see the advancement of the lived experience workforce playing a crucial role. And I recognise the work that the lived experience advocates and people in identified lived experience roles have already done, and thank you. I'm really excited to see the journey the workforce strategy takes. Thank you to my fellow Queensland Alliance board members, who many are here today. Yesterday at our AGM and our general meeting, we welcomed two new board members, Tanya O'Shea and Stephanie Norton, who are here somewhere. Hello. <laughs> uh, we also said farewell to Jeremy Ordis and Karen Thompson. Thank you, Jeremy and Karen, for your years and years of dedication to the Alliance. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you to Jennifer and the staff of the Queensland Alliance and just looking at the annual report this year, it is so obvious that the amount of work that the Alliance have done for us and, and with the sector and thank you so much. And also thank you to the Alliance members for your dedication to the sector. Thank you for your passion, your commitment and your grit and I hope you enjoy the day that we have planned for you. Thank you. me. Good morning everyone. Um, Chris Skelton's my name and I'm very happy to say I'm the accountant in the room and so my challenge I may have taken on last year is to make sure I keep you awake for the next three minutes or so and I start talking about numbers. Um, but quite seriously it's, it's a great pleasure to, to be working with the Alliance and for the Alliance in, in a finance role. Um, I've spent a lot of time working in the not-for-profit sector and this is one of the most impressive organisations that I've seen uh, in terms of, uh, of impact and, and footprint and um, it's, uh, it's, it's a sheer delight to actually see the numbers talking to me in relation to the activities. So you read through the actual annual report and get, yep, yep, understand all that and then you see it actually um, coming out in the figures itself. So today I'd just like to very briefly step you through the, the, the concise financial report. So if I could turn you to, it's on page 39 if you'd like to have a look of, uh, of your annual report. So I'll give you just a moment just to get there. So what we have is, the, um, is, a, is a, a concise financial report. It's not the full financial report. Um, that document is available um, on our website, the ACNC, and, uh, and I'm sure um, um, uh, if you ha can't get a, hand on a co get a copy, just give us a call and we'll get one to you as well. Um, so it's a summary financial report. The longer financial report, though, does have a lot more information by way of notes and those sorts of things. So if you look at this page, this is our income and expenditure statement. And you'll see for the year end of June 23, our total revenue is 1.76 million compared to 1.375 in the prior year. So as you can see in, in the, the, the reflections in the annual report, we've had a big year. 
you know, of, of work. And, uh, and, it's, and it's very much reflected in these numbers. So you'll see our revenue is up. Our expenses, of course, are up. And, um, and it's, uh, it's, so we're pleased to report that we have actually recorded a surplus this year. Um, so that's good budgetary control by, by the team has, uh, has resulted in that. So um, I'll mention the team a couple of times because the team makes me look good as the finance director. Um, <laughs> So that movement in revenue expenses just reflects a big year for us and uh, a great year of activity and much to look forward to going ahead. Um, on page 39, the next one, you'll just see where we've finished in terms of our financial position. And so um, that used to be called a balance sheet. For some reason, we call it the statement of financial position. Um, so you can see there we, we finished the year with about $2.2 in cash. Um, you might say that sounds like a lot of money. It is. But if you look down below, we've got some sizable, sizable liabilities. Now, our major liability is, is, is largely income in advance. So under the accounting rules, our cash might be up, but our income in advance is up. And that's, that movement is all just reflects on the timing of when we receive our funding and then when we put that funding into action. And so we, 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 put, we hold it in, in abeyance in the balance sheet as a liability until we actually work on programs. So that's why our cash is up, but that's just giving us a big head of steam for a big year, which is reflected in our income in advance. But um, please to note, we did finish the year with um, a net equity position, so our assets exceeded our liabilities by about $1.3 million. So that's that figure at the bottom. The, the next page I'd like to just draw your attention to, uh, and having been a former audit partner, I, I, this is the exciting page, um, it's page 42. Um, so, so page 42 is the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the audit report. Now, there's quite a lot of words there, but the, the, the essence is that the auditors are happy and, uh, and they've given us what's called a clean audit report. We auditors take a long time to say things and, and this is another way as well. So it's a clean report, which is very pleasing and, and, and it leads to me just to, um, to make some closing comments. Thanks to the team, to, to Jennifer's leadership, to Marie Halloran, who, um, who does all the numbers work behind this, runs our zero accounting systems, keeps the, keeps the finances uh, under control. And, uh, and I say thank you for, for that great work. Thank you to my colleagues on the finance subcommittee, or the fund subcommittee, as we call it. And, um, and, and thank you at large for your support. Queensland Government, we acknowledge and thank for our support as well. Um, and... And that's it for me. I'm, I'm most welcome to take some comments and questions outside the report, but I won't hold the show up, that's for sure. Woof, picture of everyone. I love it. <laughs> um, hello, everyone. Jennifer Black, CEO of Queensland Alliance for Mental Health. And this is four years now I've been in this role. Um, I'd like to echo the sentiments of my colleagues and uh, uh, pay my respects to the traditional custodians of the lands on which we meet today. I'd like to thank Chris for making the numbers fun uh, and Melanie uh, for your support. Well, Cathy's been away over the uh, past couple of uh, weeks. It's been quite busy and we've been in and out of Parliament House, which we can talk more about. Um, so this year has been the biggest yet since I became CEO and I can confidently say that because this year's annual report is 12 pages longer than the last one and it's not just photos. <laughs> um, we've taken on some really big projects. Today you're going to hear about the Workforce Strategy Project and the Peer Scholarships but there's a lot of other work behind all of that. So with our 125 members, we've represented them on 33 committees, we've held 19 member forums, and we've elevated the voice of the sector in 19 submissions, reports, and position papers. And aside from all of that, uh, this year, we've also become Queensland's psychosocial peak body. The PPB, as we fondly call, call it in the office, um, is led by Simon Clough. Here he is, there. Simon has worked extensively across the community sector and is passionate about lived experience practice. The PPB is a service to guide people around the psychosocial supports in their areas. It advocates for people with psychosocial disability. And I say that word with some trepidation um, because it's a term we really struggle with. 
because people with psychosocial challenges don't necessarily identify with the term disability. Um, mental health challenges, as you all know, can be episodic and working towards recovery should be the goal of any support. So I believe PPB, through, even though it's in its early stages, is an essential service with a crucial role to play in systems reform. And Simon, and, and with comms support from Lisa Greenaway, We've been developing the work of the Psychosocial Peak Body through our other important project at QAMH, the Wellbeing First Innovation Hub. And I know we've got some Innovation Hub members here in the room today, so that's pretty exciting. So member organisations in the Hub are working to redesign services. Um, putting into practice the Wellbeing First principles co-designed through consultations post the release of the report. So if you haven't read this, there's a few copies outside to have a look at. Um, we started the Innovation Hub with about 17 member organisations who participated in some design thinking training. Uh, the work has now moved on to um, some specific projects around redesign within those, uh, within those services, but principally using the uh, Wellbeing First principles. Some of our participants have moved on or been challenged with all the other work that they've got on, but we still have around 12 active projects on the go at the moment. And the ideas coming from this are ex ex really exciting and really stretching our thinking. I'm looking at Emma as I say that. Uh, and we hope to showcase those um, at the f in the first half of 2024. So this year, QMH has also um, embarked on its first reconciliation action plan. And what a year to do that. QMH was a vocal supporter of the yes case in the referendum. We believed, looking at the evidence and the arguments, that a voice to parliament would have led to a better mental would have led to better mental health outcomes for the most marginalised people in Australia. And regardless of where you sat personally, there's no denying the pain, the debate and the outcome has caused Australia's First Nations people. QAMH has just signed up to begin its second stage wrap, an innovate wrap. And it feels like crucial work, not just as a peak body, but simply as people who live in this land. I should also mention too, that yesterday we lodged our state budget submission. And a bit of a first, because we partnered with ARAFME and the, uh, the Mental Health Lived Experience Peak Queensland to do this. Um, we worked really hard analysing available figures, which is really hard to do, really hard to get access to them, but we looked at the ROGS figures of 2021, which are the, um, the latest we had available to us. And so these are our asks. So we've asked for an increase in recurrent investment by an additional 151.3 million <laughs> for non-government mental health organisations um, this is uh, the figure we've calculated to fill the gap in psychosocial supports for people with severe and complex mental illness. Uh, we've called for a 60% increase in funding for organisations delivering specialist homelessness services. We know there are some unique challenges in Queensland around housing uh, and increasing levels of, of mental distress. Um, we think that's an important one. We've also made a call to establish a Chief Lived Experience Officer Mental Health for Queensland. And we're backing this call from the Mental Health Lived Experience Peak Queensland um, because we believe this would be key to our workforce strategy. Um, in addition to that, uh, we've asked for funding to implement the components of the workforce strategy uh, that we could do in our role as building capacity in our sector. And there's one more. <laughs> We're calling to push ahead with existing models of social prescribing and try new ones, particularly in regional and remote Queensland. Um, so you're gonna hear more about that over the next 12 months, but that's a sneak peek of what we've, um, what we've come up with. So you see, it really has been a very big year. And 2023-24 is keeping pace. 
My thanks to all of the QAMH team. They're a really committed professional group and I know they've been really stressed this week about the biggest event in our calendar, but they've done a, a stellar job. I'd also like to acknowledge a couple of key staff who found opportunities elsewhere just in the past couple of months, and that's Sarah Childs and Sally McLeod. They both worked very hard on the Workforce Strategy Project and we're sorry to see them go. But what that does mean is I've got a couple of key jobs that I'm looking for someone to fill. Chat to me in the lunch break. So you've got the annual report, you've heard my thoughts, and to round up the reporting side of today's gathering, we're going to show you some highlights and I'd like to thank Kristen and Lisa under Emma's guidance that put this together. It's fabulous. My favourite thing this year for the Peer Work Scholarships has been meeting so many awesome people who are willing to use their lived experience and recovery journeys to work in the lived experience peer workforce. It's been the first year of the psychosocial peer body. It's been a real privilege to connect with people experiencing mental health challenges, their carers and kin. We've worked really hard to identify some of the major issues that are affecting them and the things that we may be able to do to change and, and improve their systems of support. It's been an absolute pleasure to be involved in developing this workforce strategy for the community mental health and wellbeing sector. It's so exciting to be able to articulate the unique challenges facing the sector and have a systematic way of addressing these problems. It's the first of its kind in Australia. Aren't we getting high tech? <laughs> Love it. So uh, some of the work you saw in that video is culminating today as we launch this draft workforce strategy. Um, ever since I took this role on, I've heard from members that workforce was their number one concern. And that's through informal discussions as we travel around the state and formally through our annual survey. And with funding and support from the Mental Health, Alcohol and Other Drugs branch, uh, this project was born. It began with a survey of organisations in our sector. The first such workforce sur survey for our sector in Queensland, and one we intend to hold every three years. And while it received a fairly typical response rate of 40%, because we know you're all really busy, uh, we believe the results are representative of our sector. The results confirm for me that workforce is absolutely the area we should be addressing. 
And here's how respondents rated their workforce challenges. Number one, workforce shortages. Two, inadequate funding. And three, worker wellbeing. We've got our work cut out for us, haven't we? So with those results in hand, we began a consultation across the state and gathered a project advisory committee of 21 leaders and experts. And I'd like to thank all of the members of this committee for their advice and guidance, for their time and dedication and their work to make sure this draft is as good as it could possibly be. So who's the workforce we're talking about? Because very little data is officially collected about them. And they're largely invisible and misunderstood. A situation we're hoping to rectify. And whilst we acknowledge our sector employs both clinical and non-clinical staff, we felt that the clinical workforce shortages were largely the focus of the national uh, workforce strategy for mental health. Um, with the non-clinical or so psychosocial workforce um, largely ignored. It's for that reason that this strategy addresses the psychosocial workforce employed in non-government, not-for-profit, community-based organisations in Queensland. And, our, and they're called many different things um, depending on where they work and what organisation they work for. They might be recovery support workers, psychosocial support workers, support coordinators, recovery coaches, peer workers, other lived experience roles, and managers with many, many titles. But the one thing they do all have in common is that they're all people working to support other people who are experiencing mental health challenges. And they can be trained, given the skills they need, and put to work much more quickly than traditional clinical roles. And if Queenslanders are received the psychosocial services they need, we need more of these people to work, work in more of our services. So we've identified 19 key priorities in this workforce strategy, including reviewing the CERT for in mental health and mental health peer work, introducing traineeships, developing a campaign to raise awareness of the sector as a desirable place to work, and developing and embedding a core competency frames, framework, setting out the desirable attributes for people working in our sector. All of the priorities are laid out, at, all the priorities are laid out in the strategy document, but some of them will be featured today. And we believe if we put these ideas into action, we'll be addressing some of the top challenges that our members have been talking to us about for a long time. And we may be closer to the vision that, that we put in the strategy, a contemporary, person-led, culturally safe workforce equipped with the optimal skill mix of skills and knowledge to meet the needs of Queenslanders experiencing mental health challenges along the full continuum of care. Wouldn't that be good? And I, am I right to welcome the Assistant Minister? Do we have Emma here somewhere? Shall I dance? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, give us a minute. It's always hard to get the timing of the politicians right, isn't it? <laughs> but what I will say is that uh, uh, Shannon Fenterman was hoping to be here. Um, and she was unable to, so as a little bit of compensation, she invited us to have lunch with her on Wednesday, and we had a fabulous chat about some of the priorities in here. Am I good? I don't know. I yeah. to, I to, <laughs> good. Okay. So with that, <laughs> it's my pleasure uh, to introduce someone who may well have a bit of influence over whether, whether we get to push this strategy forward. The Queensland Assistant Minister, Member for Keppel, Brittany Lauger. Welcome. Good morning, everyone. How are you? 
That's good. I've just um, come from my hotel and enjoying this beautiful rosella water, uh, which is just lovely. And I've never been to the State Library before. So my electorate is in Yapoon in central Queensland. So I feel like a bit of a country mouse when I come down to <laughs> Brisbane, uh, as do a lot of my constituents. And um, yeah, it's what an amazing place. I wish that we had libraries like this here um, that you guys have are so lucky to have. But um, I think I might have to come here again. It's just got this really beautiful sort of sense of peace here. Do you sort of feel that as well? It's a great choice for the Mental Health Alliance um, meeting that you're having here today. Um, look, uh, ladies and gentlemen, can I start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we gather today, the Yagara and Turrbal people, and pay respects to their elders past, present and future, uh, and uh, acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which you all come from. I assume that there's people from all over the place. Uh, who has travelled to be here today? A show of hands. Okay. Oh, there's a few online as well. Okay, wonderful. <laughs> oh, three minutes drive. You are very lucky. <laughs> Uh, my electorate in central Queensland, Yapoon, uh, the traditional owners and native title holders are the Durumbal people and I also have the Wapabara people as well who are also traditional owners and native title holders and I'm very lucky I think uh, in my part of the world I was one of, I think I'm probably the first and maybe the only electorate in Queensland where my electorate is entirely native title determined. Uh, so it's wonderful to see how I was there the day of the Durumbal Native Title Determination in 2016 and um, I think back to that and uh, one of the, the children uh, that day, their mother was saying, uh, come on mum, we've got to go, uh, the, the mother was saying, come on, we've got to go home kids and uh, the child was saying, no mum, but we've only just got our land back, <laughs> come on, <laughs> we've got to celebrate. <laughs> so. I am very lucky indeed to have um, native title determined um, land that I come from. So acknowledge the traditional owners that, uh, of the land on which you all come from as well. Um, uh, and I of course would like to acknowledge First Nations people who are here today. Uh, it's my pleasure to speak here today and at the outset I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the Queensland Alliance for Mental Health for their advocacy and collaboration. Uh, and your work, everything that you do every day is about helping support the health and wellbeing of Queenslanders. And uh, for that, on behalf of the government, we're very grateful. So thank you. I know that it's a difficult job and um, that you are probably at times burnt out and frustrated, but at the end of the day, we're all here to make a difference to the lives of people. So thank you for the work that you do. Um, I greatly value the knowledge and skills brought by our community mental health organisations to support the broader public mental health system. You deliver a critical service that enables people with severe mental illness to live well in the community through support to manage daily activities, rebuild and maintain connections, build social skills and participate in education and employment. You give people life effectively. You give people a life. As we all know, providing mental health support and care is complex and providing suitable and sufficient services is becoming increasingly more difficult as Queensland's population grows. We acknowledge there is unmet need for psychosocial supports in Queensland for people with severe mental illness, but without mental health community support services, public mental health services would be further stretched. We are now working to better understand the extent of this need for psychosocial supports outside the National Disability Insurance Scheme joining other states and territories in an analysis of this topic. The Queensland Government is working hard to enhance suicide prevention and mental health, alcohol and other drug services throughout the state, with a record investment of an additional $1.6 billion over five years to support the sector announced earlier this year. This is the most comprehensive boost to mental health, alcohol and other drug services in the state's history and part of the Queensland Government's five-year mental health plan, Better Care Together. Prior, priority areas of Better Care Together include putting in place strategies to support the delivery of culturally safe and capable mental health, alcohol and other drug services for First Nations people and continuing to build the First Nations mental health workforce. It's really important. 
We are also focused on improving specialist perinatal and infant mental health services and creating new and diverse services to support children, adolescents and young people and their families with acute and crisis present presentations, including those with eating disorders and those engaged in the youth justice system. This ongoing investment will not only positively impact those experiencing mental health issues, but also their family and friends. The Queensland Government will also continue to pursue additional investment for psychosocial supports. New funding from 24-25 under Better Care Together will go further to address service need for people requiring psychosocial support. We're consulting with several stakeholders, including hospital and health services, GPs and people with a lived experience of mental illness and their families and carers to inform this investment. I also acknowledge the mental health sector experiences unique workforce challenges and I know that recruiting, retaining and developing the mental health workforce can be difficult. Everywhere I go, uh, particularly in this portfolio of health, uh, everyone is talking to me about workforce. So I'm really pleased to hear that this is one of the key topics of your uh, discussion today. I, under, uh, I appreciate the work undertaken by QAMH in consulting with the sector to pre prepare a community mental health and wellbeing workforce strategy in response to these challenges. This is the first strategy of its kind for mental health workforces in Australia, and it's anticipated that it will help guide planning, policy and funding priorities over the next five years in Queensland. No doubt, though, that the rest of the country will be looking upon Queensland and probably copying and pasting the work that you're doing here uh, and saying, you know, what's Queensland doing? Look at what they're doing. Maybe we should be doing the same. So I'm really pleased that you are really leading the nation uh, in the work that you're doing. We're looking forward to working with the Alliance on an action plan for this workforce strategy soon, which will deal with how we can better address workforce skill development needs, career pathways and worker wellbeing in the sector. Supporting and improving mental health services is a priority for the Palaszczuk Government. Thank you to the Alliance and their members for all the work that you do. I look forward to working together as we continue to enhance psychosocial support services for Queenslanders. And if I might just add as well, I, mean, I had a, um, I, I went through this speech and had all sorts of notes and additions, addendums, all sorts of ideas of what I was going to talk to you about today, but sort of got thrown out the window this morning. I've had some really bad, terrible um, personal news. I've got a friend who's um, on life support that they're turning off today. So it's just awful. But um, I wanted to just say to you that um, often in mental health, we talk about uh, mental health is often sort of perceived in a, such a negative way. It's um, if you've got men a mental health issue, it's a negative, you're sick, you know, um, you're crazy, you're, you're in a corner. Um, and if you work in mental health, it's, oh, that's a tough job. But it's an important job. And I think I, we maybe need to get a bit cognitive behavioural therapy with our own, with, with your industry and with, with our own sector and sort of look at this in a different way. Um, that we're saving lives, that you're saving lives, that we're working to um, create a better community. Um, the Surf Lifesavers, yeah, I think about this often, they don't talk about the number of people who drowned in a year, they talk about the number of lives that they saved. And, you know, maybe if we turn the language and talk about the number of lives that you've saved, that your organisations, that your workforce has saved, that your lifesavers, uh, not necessarily mental health workers, although I don't think that there's really that big a problem with saying that. It's just something about the stigma and, you know, maybe let's turn the stigma on its head. So I hope that you have a wonderful day. It's uh, really great to be here with you. Uh, I have to catch a flight uh, later, but I hope to be able to be with you for a little while to hear some of the conversations and discussions. And you know, look, I'm happy to take questions if you'd like, um, but thank you again for all of the work that you do as mental health support workers in our state. Thank you. Thank you. It's very kind of you. Thank you so much, Assistant Minister. And you did really well given the news that you've just told us about. That's that's extraordinary to turn up and do do that. 
Yeah. <laughs> well, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Um, uh, the next speaker needs no introduction. Uh, Ivan Frakovic, the Queensland Mental Health Commissioner. And Ivan's going to focus on a piece of work that we jointly did over the last, mm, shall I say, two years. Now, Ivan. But Thank you and good morning, everybody. Um, it's great to be back here. And um, can I also start uh, by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands that we meet and pay my respects to elders past and present? Can I also acknowledge Miss Brittany Lauger, um, member for Keppel, but also the Assistant Minister, Minister for Regional uh, for Health, but also Regional Health and Infrastructure? Thank you very much. And we've had some interesting discussions, and uh, uh, apart from the personal news that you got, I was really interested in your comments around we need to change the language. And I think the language for us is a real challenge in, in this sector, including the drug and alcohol sector, but also in the suicide prevention sector. Can I also particularly acknowledge Melanie and the board for the great work that they do at the Alliance, J Jennifer and the staff, but also the member organisations, the 125 that are members, but also others that work in this space. Can I also say that we have this important growth and development in the mental health sector, generally talking, uh, as the Assistant Minister has, has particularly outlined, and we've got a massive investment. Um, we've also got, with that coming, a whole range of workforce issues that we need to tackle. We can have all the dollars in the world, but it's going to be challenging to find the workforce, both in the government and non-government sectors. But I think there's some things that we need to say pretty basically that we all understand is that we need an appropriately structured, skilled, supported, but also remunerated mental health workforce, particularly in the community mental health sector, which I think is a critical aspect. Now, I know those words, and we've spoken around that all the time, and I think, and I'll talk more a little bit more, I think the... The workforce strategy which the Alliance has put together gives a lot of meat into that about what we need to do and what we need to do fairly quickly to be able to do that. Now we, uh, last year, which was, uh, we have the leading reform summit, we had a workforce summit particularly around these issues and people came up with some really interesting ideas and ways forward to be able to address some of these workforce issues both in the public, private and NGO sectors. Nothing uh, that you wouldn't be aware of. But I think some of the strategies that people talked about were quite innovative. So in the areas, and I could go on about this, you can read this, but it's really about, you know, how do you build the workforce supply and those pathways of students and workforce coming into the system, I think, is really critical. But also, I think, as Jennifer talked about, how do you build workforce skills, knowledge and capabilities to work in these sectors, particularly that we have, you know, clinical, psychosocial, lived experience, how do we make sure that we build the skills, knowledge and the capabilities? But also, as was mentioned, I think the third priority was, was about how do we support the safety, well-being and retention of our workforce? Because, again, some of the sort of challenges are about retaining people in this sector. We also need to have a strong focus, and I've just done some work with the PHNs on rural, remote, regional workforce. Now, if we think we've got it tough in the southeast corner, when you go beyond that, the workforce is much more challenging in terms of retaining, attraction, et cetera. So we need a strong focus around that. But also we need to look at the system enablers. And I think the survey that the Alliance has done and other data that we need to have and information is critical for us to make some decisions around how to really address the workforce issues and shortages. Can I say that even though Jennifer said that the national strategy is really focused on the clinical system, I think it is, but it also provides some of the things that we're talking about and that you identified in the workforce plan that you've developed. But can I also say that it also aligns with the piece of work that Jennifer did allude to that we've done with the Alliance and also Griffith University, looking primarily at the growth, development and, sust and sustainability of the non-government community mental health sector in Queensland. We partnered with Griffith University and tried to look at the sector and what are the sort of critical 
critical elements that we need to understand to both grow, develop, but also sustain this sector. We've seen organisations come and go in this sector, I can tell you, particularly since the introduction of the NDIS. And today I will just share with you some of the key learnings from this analysis, and that report should be available publicly soon. But also, what are some of the imperatives for success in terms of growing and developing our community mental health sector in a much greater way than we have up to now? The purpose of this analysis was really to look at and to inform the strategic direction and also the sort of commitment towards this sector over the next five years. And I can tell you this, this commenced when we did the last retendering of the Mental Health Community Support Services by Queensland Health. The then Health Minister, Minister Stephen Miles at the time, uh, it asked the Commission to do a piece of work around this to look at how do we actually grow sustain but also develop the sector, the actual sector moving forward into the future. So this is the piece of work that's come from that, if you recall. Um, what, we, what we primarily learned was that we need some of these fundamental shifts from which I think the Alliance is doing really well around from just managing illness to supporting people to maintain wellness. So I think we need that shift, and that came through very strongly in the work that was done in this report, but also it's come up through the Alliance work in terms of the workforce. But also, and this is the bigger shift that we need, is like turning the Titanic. How do we shift the system from a hospital-centric, clinical-centric system to a community-centric system? And community includes both clinical and psychosocial support, if I can use those words more broadly. How do we shift that system? Now, there is a slow shift, and we're seeing that, but I don't think we're seeing the shift quick enough to be able to meet communities' needs in this area. But also that community shift about being able to support people early rather than late intervention, which I think is the critical aspect. Most of our system currently is designed for late intervention. How do we shift that system community and early intervention? We looked at and explored the current state of the sector in this piece of work, but also then how do we move beyond the current sort of service delivery models and locked into working in a particular way with all due respect set by people in George Street here or people in Canberra telling people in Kanamala, Longreach, you know, Sunshine Coast, Gold Coast, this is what you can deliver in this frame for this group of people, all those barriers that actually stop providing flexible, you know, innovative service responses to people. Um, so what we heard, and I'll just go through a little bit of this, what we heard was that this sector provides invaluable, highly effective and life-changing support for people in distress, but also with mental illness. Now, in distress is the area that I don't think we do as well because we're actually not funded to do a lot of that stuff. We're always funded to support people at the more severe end of the spectrum. So I think we could do better if we could move the system as the Alliance is trying to sort of also shift to a well-being, wellness approach. Um, there is also clearly things identified in this report uh, about what is preventing the sector from achieving its full potential. So I think these are important elements to understand and it's the collective feedback that we got from you and others in the room. Again, some of the discussion has already started around this insecure, unstable funding models including just the levels of investment and how that impacts. Now, we're talking about workforce, but that impacts on your ability to attract and retain your workforce. So we've got to think about some of these things, and certainly we hope to use this report with the Alliance and a whole range of other players to be able to brief government, but also to have discussions with various funders, government agencies, particularly Commonwealth and State and PHNs around some of these issues and how they can be particularly addressed. The other one that's particularly tricky is around flexibility in funding. I think the problem with the current system, as, as I see it, and having lived in the non-government sector before I came into this role, um, flexibility is not there. You get told exactly what you can and can't do. You know, We have a system, as I think it talks a bit further down, a system that's based on exclusion criteria, not inclusion criteria. So every program, every service system, has an exclusion criteria. I assess you to see if I can first exclude you 
and refer you somewhere else, rather that my job is, doesn't matter where you touch the system, to include you. And I think that's the problem we've got from a systems perspective, and that certainly came through this. We also don't have a good distribution of our services across the state, particularly rural regional, and I've certainly heard a lot from the rural regional space around even the work that we do, but the policy direction that we set is all southeast centric. Southeast centric, and then we sort of bleed into the, into the regions. One of the challenges they put to me was, can you develop a statewide plan, not just a help, a statewide plan around mental health, which focuses from a rural regional perspective to a southeast view rather than actually the other way around. And that's not easy, but this is the challenge that I think that we have for such a large state as Queensland. Picking up the stigma and discrimination, that impacts on our workforce. That impacts on people wanting to come and stay in this particular space. Unless we start to tackle that, I think we're going to still have problems in terms of attracting people and keeping people in the sector. But also, I think we've got this ongoing challenge between clinical and non-clinical, and we tend to value, generally, clinical interventions more so than non-clinical. I see it as complementary. I think you need both, and people will need both. But I think at the moment, and the way the system's set up, we tend to value, as a system, as a community, clinical intervention. And there's some work to be done around, you know, the image and people understanding of the value that's provided by the non-government sector. But say, for example, in New Zealand, and I think <laughs> Jennifer and I have used this example on many a times, when you fund from your local LHD there, or our HHS, when you fund psychosocial support, you know, to a level of 20 to 25 to 30 percent of your budget, mental health budget for that HHS, guess what? You don't have the same pressures in ED, you don't have the same pressures in inpatient services, so how do we actually increase the investment in the non-government community support sector? Jennifer's raised this a number of times and so have I and others. You know, we have had investment in the non-government sector between 8 and 12 per cent, depending on how much is in the public system it goes up. In, in Queensland, between 8 and 12. When you think about other jurisdictions who are investing 20, 25%. But that also, again, this is all linked to workforce. This is all still linked to workforce. If you don't have an adequate investment, people are under the pump, they don't, work, they don't want to work in the sector, they'll, you know, they'll move on. We need to be able to really think about how much we are investing and pushing the system further to invest more in this space. But there was, there was other thing, workforce shortages, and I, you know, I could go on about that. But also this, the complex arrangement of the system between government, non-government, private, public, etc. People are saying that really it's, it's a struggle to negotiate an outcome for yourself. People find it hard. We find it hard to work in the system. Imagine what it's like for people trying to negotiate something. We've got to simplify the arrangements and really people don't particularly care. Consumers, carers and families tell me this all the time. Who's providing the, you know, who's providing the service? Is it a psychiatrist, support worker, clinician, etc.? It's the right support at the right time that I need. I'm not really looking for an individual or an individual professional grouping. But I'm also not interested whether it's public, private or NGO and who's funding it. I just need the response to be able to move. And they're the sorts of things that I think we need to shift in all of this. Yes, workforce is important, but as part of that, if we don't shift some of this stuff, we're going to continue to have some of the challenges that we have in the workforce space. And particularly... This report highlighted we really don't have a large enough investment or really the provision of services, particularly around our First Nations, cold communities, but also the LGBTIQ community. We need to start to really expand this sector to be able to pick up supports for those people because they're actually underserviced at the moment, particularly when it comes to the psychosocial support. So these are some of the things, and I'll finish by saying the, some of the success imperatives which this report came up with and, you know, uh, I think these are the things that we'd like to take forward in addition to obviously workforce because workforce was in here. So one of the sort of uh, success imperatives is really the impact on the workforce, but also workforce is a success imperative in this report as well. So it's both. If you think about, you know, sector um, visibility and identity, and Jennifer and I have talked about this, there is a piece of work to really uh, enhance the knowledge and understanding and awareness within the community of the value and what's available in the 
non-government community mental health sector. There is still, there, I mean, I think that sort of visibility and value of the sector is still not well understood and known. I think we've got to do more work on that. We've also got to look at, and, that, and this came, you know, again through the report, how do we engage better and embed lived experience within the non-government sector as well? Now, I think people are saying we're doing well, et cetera, but certainly came through that report that more work could be done around embedding both at the front line, service management, boards, et cetera. How do you actually look at really engaging in a meaningful way lived experience? I think that's an important one. The stuff that you know, I spoke about earlier was data and evaluation. Now, I'll link this to, again, workforce and workforce development because that's what came up next. When we get a contract of funding into the non-government sector, how much recognition is there? It's not just about the service that we're delivering, but also the back office stuff about being able to collect the data, being able to analyse the data, being able to link the data with other NGOs, but also that we need to have funding to develop our staff, to train our staff, all that sort of stuff. That's hard to negotiate because when you're when you're applying in a competitive tender process, you know, the cheaper you are, maybe you might get the contract, but can you still deliver on everything that you need to do without having the money to do your back office stuff, which data collection, analysis, staff development, recruitment, all those things. I think we've got to think about those things and that all impacts on the workforce. The other one that's really hard is this one about, you know, people talked about that the, that the NGO community sector needs to be better integrated with the public and private systems, et cetera. And um, I think that is a challenge, and I was speaking to one of my colleagues here this morning. You know, you have a competitive nature to get a grant, and then when someone wins, you're asked, that, let's work together now. <laughs> you won, I lost, and that's okay, but we'll do, we're friends, we'll work together. Look, it works to some degree, but that is a challenge in the system. And I think some of this competitive nature and approach, certainly from my perspective, if an organisation is doing well and delivering, do we need to keep going through a competitive process all the time? And the cost of that, et cetera. I mean, we don't go through a competitive process to provide public mental health services. We don't go through a competitive service, you know, sorry, a competitive approach to fund um, the private sector. But we go through a competitive process regularly around the non-government sector. I think these are some of the things we've got to think about, more systemic shifts around that. And when it comes to funding, I think it's about the level of funding that is allocated, but also the duration of funding. And certainly, we need to think about what's the real cost. I mean, I think that whole notion that if you give it to the non-government sector, they can do it for cheaper. I think we've got to be able to remove that. It's about, ha it's about having the right skills, the right person, at the right cost to be able to do the job, rather than saying, well, we can do this cheaper than the public system, so we should get funded. I think we've got to move away from that, because I think that will build this sector. But also, <coughs> particularly around the funding stuff, certainly the advocacy that's come to me, but also I've, I've started to experience this when I was in the non-government sector, was we've got to stop these pilots that have no recurrent funding. Now, this is something I will be putting to government, to not, not so much government, but to the agencies. There should be a commitment, and this is what I'm pushing, and I'm hoping the Alliance will also support them, and other picks around, don't fund a pilot if you're not committed to continued funding if it's successful. And I've, been, I've had that experience myself in the non-government sector, but that impacts on workforce. If you don't have any commitment to recurrent funding, even if things are working well, people are going to leave you early. They're going to look for other jobs. We see that all the time. I think we've got to get away from this land of pilots. And look, and I'm in a difficult spot at the moment because we're getting some money to run a whole range of things. But my challenge is how do we make sure that we, at the end of this process, there is recurrent opportunities for those people that have succeeded in innovative models, et cetera, to move the system forward rather than say, great work, thank you very much, we have no money, let's move on. I mean, I think we've got to move actually beyond that. I'll just finish by saying this report will be released fairly soon. It has all of that. But I think collectively we need to work on actually moving this forward. Um, I'd like to say that it was, it was great working with the Alliance and, you know, a university department to actually get this broader understanding, which includes workforce, and I didn't spend a lot of time around workforce because I think it's picked up in here, but workforce was one of those critical success factors. Um, and again, I look, thank the Alliance for launching 
the workforce strategy because it actually unpacks some of the workforce stuff that was found in this report. It gives it much more teeth. I think the challenge now is, and I think Jennifer Neffer, how do we drive implementation of that? And where do we get the resources from to drive the implementation to ensure that we don't have just another great document on a shelf, but in actual fact that it's actually achieving some of the things that we said we need to do. That's all I wanted to say at this particular point. I hope that sort of brought, brought a, a broader context around workforce because just focusing on workforce without some of these broader things, I think we're still going to experience some of these challenges in the years to come. So thank you. Okay, thank you, Ivan, for that. We're, we're running a bit early. That's a surprise, isn't it? <laughs> I know she did, yeah, you did very well. Uh, <laughs> we're going to take a break uh, and come, go and have some morning tea across the, across, across the foyer on the terrace and we're going to come back at 10.45. Thank you. Interesting, doesn't it? <laughs> Um, so now uh, the next part of this process is to delve into some of the detail of the strategy. You're going to hear from various expert speakers including our panel members and if you could make welcome uh, from Melbourne, lived experience strategic lead at Wellways and academic at La Trobe University, Dr Catherine Brazier. And we have Rita Prasad Ildesh, um, who is the co-founder of World Wellness Group and has been a crucial member of our advisory group for the, for the project. And uh, John Kane, CEO of North and West Remote Health. Thank you. Thank you all. So each of these people bring a specific knowledge to the discussion. Um, so thank you so much for being here today. Um, the Workforce Project has been funded by Queensland Health and even more importantly, Sandra, can I say backed by Queensland Health. <laughs> and we hope it will be further supported in the implementation phase. So can we welcome from the Mental Health, Alcohol and Other Drugs Strategy and Planning Branch, Sandra Eyre, to say a few words. Thanks everyone and it literally will be a, um, just a few words. Uh, I do want to um, pay my respects to uh, Elders past present um, uh, and um, acknowledge the traditional owners of the land upon which we're meeting today. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge um, people with lived experience and welcome your um, active um, contribution to everything that we do in the branch, actually. It's, um, and just on that, you're probably aware that we've um, just advertised a, a new manager of lived experience role and they'll, we'll shortly be um, advertising a principal policy officer uh, to work alongside that manager as well. So we're very excited about that. Um, so uh, as Jennifer said, uh, yes, we were very happy to fund the Alliance to undertake this piece of work. It's something we've actually been thinking about for a couple of years. So it was a great opportunity when Jennifer and the team came across and we had some discussions about it. Um, and um, members of the branch have participated in the the uh, governance across that project. I'm very pleased that the governance has been really inclusive and um, the Alliance has been um, really striving to get as many voices as possible involved in the piece of work. So it's great now that it's at a stage that it can go out for consultation. Um, there's a lot of really good actions in the... Um, the draft, and I don't want to preempt anything, but as Jennifer said, we we really do back it, and it's it's good timing that this strategy is getting out there. Uh, we really want um, you to let us know about the actions, validate them, tell us if they're wrong or um, we've got the wrong end of the stick, and. Um, 
the, as I said, the timing's really good because we really want, want to feed into the processes where we can look to support um, the strategies um, with some funding, if that is possible. Um, there's a lot in it and it really spans across um, uh, the, the pipeline, the recruitment, the retention, qualifications, training, even looking at um, how we can do better with particular costing and funding models to support um, uh, workforce sustainability because you know, it's really one of the biggest expenses that an organisation has. Um, I know labour costs add, uh, add to about 90% 90, 90 of the Queensland health budget, so I imagine they're probably pretty significant across your organisations. So we really want to have a look at um, a, a new costing model to support, um, to support appropriate levels of funding going out um, uh, to you. Um, Better Care Together is one of the key priorities, uh, is looking at our workforce. There's a lot of work happening internally across the, um, the hospital and health service workforce. Uh, you'll all be experiencing workforce shortages um, and also probably like Queensland Health, there's a number of really experienced um, workforce you have that will be going off to enjoy lovely retirements um, and it's uh, really important to try and ensure that that expertise is uh, transferred across to the new the new wave of workers coming through so we need to do a lot of work around sustainability and um, recruitment so uh, I, I might leave it at that and just once again say it's a really key um, key component it's a fabulous piece of work and um, we're really looking forward to hearing all your feedback and moving on with the next step, which is actually to progress some of those actions alongside, alongside you. So thanks very much. Thank you, Sandra, and thank you to your team as well for all the support you've given us throughout this process. Um, I'm just going to orientate you a bit to the strategy. So we've set it out in three pillars and they are qualifications and training, attraction and retention and system enablers. And we're going to go through each of those pillars and pick out um, some key things. So under each of these pillars there are key priorities and there's 19 in total so we're not going to go through the whole lot of those today. Um, but there's a couple that I do want to highlight. Um, so in terms of qualifications and training, um, we know that through various projects we've done uh, at the Alliance and uh, through what we consistently hear, that the cert for qualifications in mental health and the mental health peer work um, don't always align particularly well with industry. Uh, and that perhaps the curriculum needs some work um, going forward to make it much more contemporary. Uh, so we know that the, both the content and the delivery of these need to be reviewed and so that's one of our first actions in there. We also know that uh, st student placements are a huge battle. Um, so we're looking for ways to strengthen the links between training providers and services. Uh, we recently got <laughs> another grant uh, to employ an industry connector role whose job it will be is to work uh, on the CERT for mental health with two TAFE campuses so that we can actually do some learning about what's working and what's not working and how we can strengthen it. Um, and we also ran another pilot last year uh, uh, which was around the CERT for in mental health peer work and what we know is that people do better, students do better with some mentoring, but that's not always factored into the course coursework. Uh, so um, we've seen that again this year through delivering the Commonwealth Scholarship ships for mental health peer work through the commission and 
Ivan, you must have left it, listened to us because you gave us a bit more money so we could mentor those students as well. Um, so we're very grateful of that. And, and that's been really successful to date. Um, so we're going to tell you a little bit more about that. And Lisa Greenaway, our communications project lead, is going to take you through that. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, the Peer Work Scholarship Program is an initiative of the Australian Government Department of Health. The program aims to strengthen and grow the mental health and suicide prevention lived experience workforce. And they do this through funding the scholarships to support people to undertake the certificate for in mental health peer work. The Queensland Alliance um, has been contracted by the Queensland Mental Health Commission to deliver the program here in Queensland. Um, from the national program, Queensland has actually received the lion's share of the scholarship package with 178 scholarships available throughout 2023 and 2024. While there's a large number of scholarships, priority is given to First Nations peoples and people living in rural and remote areas. Um, all applicants also need to meet an eligibility criteria and you're welcome to pop on our website and learn a little bit more about that. Um, but this includes the commitment to 80 hours of placement as well. Um, the scholarship program is a wonderful opportunity for successful applicants to build on their lived experience and on the job experience and receive a nationally recognised qualification. And this is desired by employers for most peer worker roles. Um, there's a range of job opportunities once they've finished their course. This includes care of peer support work role, um, wellbeing coach, lifestyle facilitator, and also some graduates from the course also move into policy and advisory space and are instrumental in informing uh, systemic change when it comes to lived experience. I'm just going to run through the scholarship package with you now. So. <laughs> Um, so, in terms of the scholarship, um, our recipients, our successful recipients, um, have up to $4,000 that can go towards the cost of their course. So, on our website, we have um, the registered training organisations that offer this course, and most of them do come under that $4,000 mark, which is great. Um, and the RTOs invoice um, us directly. The payment of up to $1,000 for various supports, and this includes um, attendance and study materials. Um, a common one is laptops, um, travel, and also in some instances, accommodation, um, particularly for rural and remote areas where people might need to do a face-to-face -face session um, every month, for instance. We have partnered with Brook Red to deliver the group mentoring support um, for the duration of the course. Um, there are also various checkpoints along the way so um, where we meet individually with um, the successful applicants. We'd also like to acknowledge the Queensland Mental Health Commission, as Jennifer mentioned before, for funding the group mentoring. It's very, very well, well received, particularly when we've interviewed some of our um, successful applicants. They love that idea of having that support and also hopefully they'll see out the whole of the course. Um, so here's a top look at the application process. So the rounds open and they are promoted on our website. And also we on our website, we have the online application form. So that's the preferred method of um, applying. And also via member organisations. They've been quite instrumental in getting the message out there about the scholarship program. And we have our newsletter as well. So um, that goes to all our members. And through the RTOs as well, we let them know when our next round is happening and they also can let others know that it's available. I'd, um, a huge shout out to our members um, for promoting the scholarships with their teams and services, as well as the registered training organisations. Um, we promote all organisations we are aligned to who offer the certificate for. And if there's any other organisations that come on board, we just put that up on our website. So then um, prospective students can have a look and, and see where they'd like to study. Um, we do online group interviews. So this is um, 
bit of a novel process. We're shortlisted applicants. They're all invited to an online um, group interview session. It's a mandatory part of the application process. And they just basically, it's an introduction session and um, I get to know you. And from that, um, we have a certain um, selection criteria that we can um, work with to work out who will go forward for the next part of the round. All applicants are notified of their application outcome and it's really quite good in the sense that we're happy to give feedback as well. So if someone's been unsuccessful, sometimes people start the process and they have to stop for a reason and then they might want to come back on later and they can. And we've set up an expressions of interest form on our website so people can um, go on there and just nominate what round they're interested in and then we will contact them when that round, that round is available um, in the future. Um, yeah, and as I mentioned before, applicants also just need to ensure that they meet the eligibility and selection criteria to apply. Um, the successful applicants choose their training provider and once again that's um, just done through um, our website usually. And, yeah. and we'd like to acknowledge the work of the project advisory group um, including representatives from QAMH um, from the governance perspective, also Brook Red, the Queensland Lived Experience Workforce Network the Mental Health Lived Experience, Peak Queensland, Arafmi and Roses in the Ocean. Um, the project advisory group actually gives us really good guidance and advice um, from the perspective of their organisation and as well as relevant support to meet the project objectives. For example, the PAG members are part of the interview panel and they have also provided input into our round one process as well and we're just constantly evolving and updating the program um, to, to streamline it and make it more efficient for the end user. Okay. Oh, thank you. Um, so round one peer work scholarships, um, we had 60 places available, funded places for 2023, and we were very excited, actually ecstatic, that we received 116 um, people applying for the scholarship and we ended up awarding um, 60 places for that round one and part of that round one was also made up of a small group um, in the Wide Bay area um, where an RTO just wanted a few more people to come on board so they can do face-to-face -face classes so we just did a smaller round as well and six of the successful applicants were First Nations people and uh, 10 were successful from rural remote areas as well. And we're very lucky because, um, yes, there was a couple of um, member organisations in those rural and remote areas, for example, Emerald, that really championed the scholarship program. So that was very good. Um, yes. So round two has just closed and that is actually a TAFE round and we're just in the middle of shortlisting for that. And um, the course will be available through the Gold Coast, Sunshine Coast, Caboolture and Brisbane. This is just looking at where the award recipients were placed. So a lot of them, as you can see, are coastal, um, but we had a quite a big cluster in the Rockhampton area with 20 up there as well. So, yep. Um, I'd just like you to uh, introduce you to our amazing peer scholarship program coordinator, um, Lena. Uh, unfortunately, she's unable to be here today. And she, here she is with one of our students, Bodhi. He is actually currently studying through TAFE in Brisbane. And he commenced in July and he was recently offered a peer um, work role um, on a part-time basis. So. Yeah, he's pretty ecstatic about that. Um, we've also had the pleasure of interviewing other scholarship recipients over the last few months. And there's a common thread of the scholarship recipients that they've all been providing informal um, peer work, either currently or in the past. They've expressed their excitement that the support they provide others will be formalised with a national accredited course. 
a qualification. And they, most of them also stated that untake, undertaking the certificate for a mental health peer work would not have been possible without um, removing those financial barriers. And having the mentoring support has also enhanced people's journey and also means that they can connect with their peers as well. And I'd just like to finish with a quote. Um, and we actually were talking with Anglicare Central Queensland, and this is a beautiful quote from Harley Roberts, coordinator. And I think this just sums it up, really. Um, I know some of the people based in Emerald who have been successful in obtaining one, and it makes them feel very validated by being recipients of this scholarship. They feel they have been seen and very inspired. They feel like somebody has seen the value in what they do and gifted them this because they believe they can do it. That has been a beautiful thing to witness. So that just sort of sums it up. Um, and you're more than welcome to go onto our website and take a look at the scholarship program on the website and the application process in more detail. Thank you. change my plans. Okay. Uh, so I'd also like to acknowledge Lena, who couldn't be here today, the uh, project coordinator. We had about three minutes to stand this up when, <laughs> when we finally signed the contract. And she's just like a force of nature and she got it done. You know, fantastic. Uh, so we... Um, let's talk about traineeships because that's one of the... Uh, one of the things in the strategy that has got a lot of support from uh, the consultations around the, around the uh, state. Uh, so we're recommending that we, uh, we run traineeships for uh, mental health, the mental health qualification and the peer work qualification. And that's so that people can study and work and earn an income at the same time. At the moment, they have to go off and do 80 hours of a placement, unpaid. If they've got a job, that makes that really difficult to do. Um, and I've actually seen that in action in New Zealand. I visited New Zealand about 18 months ago, I think now. Um, and they, they do this routinely for those qualifications. Um, and like Ivan said, they, they also have a huge investment in uh, in their mental health funding that goes into the community sector. Uh, so it's really vibrant there. Um, our sister peak in New South Wales is going to zoom in at some point, but I believe she's not quite there yet, so we'll go back to her. Is that right? Or are you oh, going to tell me something else? Yeah, yeah. Um, so perhaps I can get the panel's thoughts about traineeships. Um, about how that might work in the uh, in the Queensland context, but maybe Catherine, you could talk a bit about the cadetships. I know that they're doing in Victoria and how that's working. Yeah, so I'll, I'll start by explaining that um, I have an extensive background as a receiver of higher education uh, in Australia. So both in the TAFE sector, with my um, AOD in Cert Four, which was a really pivotal moment for me in my recovery. Um, but I also have a Bachelor of Arts and I also have a Bachelor of Social Work and I've taught both Cert for Mental Health, um, the Cert for Mental Health Peer Work, um, and I've also taught mental health at a university level, but in a non-designated mental health teaching role. They just happen to be lived in lived experience academics. So um, there's, there's certainly at the moment a huge amount of room um, for um, us to be supporting mental health workforce and our new incomers, including in... Um, peer work through a variety of different educational modes that are suitable for all kinds of people who would like all kinds of careers. So um, in Victoria at the moment we have two programs that are similar to like a traineeship. So we have a peer cadet program. Wellways and the Victorian government is in their second year of completing the um, peer cadet program where you complete your cert for in peer mental health um, and then you do um, I think it's two or three days a week um, in a service, in a railway service as well. And that's actually managed by the lived experience leadership team, which is my team. So there is an extra layer of lived experience support in that. 
we had um, all five of our cadets finish and excel last year and many of them went on to have um, and maintain vocational placements within railways or outside of railways. My personal experience um, of, um, of a similar, I guess, situation was way before there was gear work, um, I guess, in our mental health system in, in 2007, or it was the first year we had peer work, at least in Victoria. Um, the importance of supporting people through um, that that period of, of placement. So uh, I've done seven months of placement in my training so far. I did what I did about one month with my Cert 4, and then you do two, three-month placements in, in social work as well. So social work has a very high level and a very intense level. And we have those same problems there where people have trouble balancing family. I knew uh, one person who was working seven days a week for those three months. Each time we do five days a week and then two days at a servo. Um, I don't know how he did it. He was a really nice person. But that's, that's not ideal and not everyone is possible um, to do that. So... I think the traineeships are really good. I think what we're learning as well is really important, especially when people have been on their recovery journey for a bit and they're just coming back into the workforce, is that they're often missing some basic expectations and um, they're not, they still have to learn and get used to basic work, things like what to wear to work, how to talk at work, um, how to answer the phone at work. And that's where we found things like the traineeships uh, much better because you have in the peer cadet model you have a mentor as well as a manager and that mentor can help you do that work and can help you do that reflective um, that reflective work with you because they see you on the floor and they see you interact with other staff and they see you interact with people that helps you develop that lived experience component and I, I think when we were talking about the mentoring factors as well before that's often a thing that is missing, both in mental health workers as in peer workers, is the ability to someone to come in and reflect back to you the things that you can't see for yourself. So that's kind of how we're seeing that working. And yeah, and earn and learn is basically the non-peer version um, of, of the peer cadets. And we're, we're really super pleased with all of our peer cadets. We're very yeah. proud. Great. So John, you bring a rural and remote perspective to this conversation what are your thoughts about yeah, it's, it's traineeships a, it's a, sorry excuse me it's a interesting it's a good subject it really is i think um traineeships cadetships in any organization um uh, i think are an important pathway and stepping stone into the next steps or progression in anyone's uh, future career i think to have that lens from a uh, a traineeship at, at an early stage, obviously, um, gives a good uh, line of sight in terms of where they sort of fit into that uh, future structure of an organisation or in the health services in general, whichever way they go. And for us particularly, look, uh, we're, we're more of a clinical-based service provider. So um, when we start talking about traineeships, uh, my mind my immediately refers to the, the supervision of training uh, and, and how that would work in the, in the clinical aspect of, of, of any organisation. Um, but I'm stepping outside the shoes of, of, of our organisation into the, 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 the service provider world more generally. Uh, and any incentive to bring uh, young people into a service or into a sector that has um, a, a traineeship or a pathway is only going to be a benefit and a positive to that, to that organisation and that sector collectively. I was just sort of, sort of reflecting too, and I couldn't quite look up in terms of those scholarships or those programs that were out there. Uh, and I couldn't quite see on the panel there about how many actually uh, were taken up or were um, were in the in the central and northwest area or in the lower Gulf area. Um, most of them, I think, were on the eastern seaboard, and that's probably early days yet at the, at the main time yeah. at, at the moment. And, and whether or not you know when we, we start talking about that is there's an access issue, um, um, you know, uh, the availability of resources available to then um, pursue a, a traineeship or a, a scholarship and a pathway for that to uh, to make it work. Uh, out of that timeline of that particular person in that sector or the, in, that, in that particular program. So in the peer scholarship program, we do have training providers who would be willing to go if there's yeah. a big enough cohort. So yeah. that's a conversation we can certainly have Absolutely. Yeah. going Thank forward. You. And I'll yeah. just add that we've had similar uh, stuff with the peer cadets and this year we were able to place someone rurally but it just took that little bit of extra coordination. Yes. But we, we were able to do that this year. So, John, one of the things that we've thought about too is that uh, regional and remote communities need to build their own and just wondering about 
your thoughts about that, about, you know, building the people in the community to be able to have these skills to contribute. Yeah, yeah. And, and I, I guess if, as a starting point uh, to that, obviously it's probably out of the schooling sector to help then support them into the next stage of, of that development into the, career, into the career pathway that they're looking for. Um, look, Grow Your Own is, is a great initiative. Uh, um, it's early days. Uh, in terms of how that's sort of looking, in terms of, of the availability or the, the take up, if you like, of, of, of scholarships and traineeships or training programs from schools uh, into the health sector. Uh, I'm not clear on that myself in terms of what that really looks like. But, uh, but it sounds uh, like but a good idea. It's a great it? idea. No, it is a great <laughs> idea. I think that, you know, uh, keeping, uh, keep uh, incentivising and keeping um, um, population people in communities so you actually can grow and develop communities so they don't move away from and diminish the community to a large extent is only a positive. It's just uh, how that sort of uh, augments well in terms of the skill set and the, the future look or the lens of the, of, the, of the students coming out of the schooling system into the health sector uh, and uh, their appetite to, uh, to remain and stay as well. Yeah, yeah. And Rita, you come from a specialist sort of service. And what, what are your thoughts about traineeships and how um, that might work for you? I think they're a really um, critical part of um, a number of... I guess strategies that have to come together in an integrated way. Um, just our experience has been um, with our multicultural peer support workforce, like we've really had to grow our own. And there's been some real challenges around that because the funding often comes very output driven. So mm -hmm. you deliver services, you got, and so you, you know, over 10 years, we've been able to build up a really sort of great pool of about sort of 60 plus multicultural peer support workers, but we've had very limited opportunities to really invest in that workforce. Um, so traineeships are great. I'm thinking about sort of the nature of our people. Um, most of our multicultural peer support workers are really highly skilled. Um, many of them are overseas trained health professionals, people mm -hmm. who can't work for a whole range of reasons, very complicated to get your skills recognised and so on. So, um, and there's no pipeline, there's no career pipeline. So it takes a lot of convincing um, to actually then do this because um, people have all sorts of economic pressures and what's their career pathway? You know, like what is the career pathway going forward? And it just really makes me think of a process that I was part of many years ago where Queensland Health funded um, a, a cert for, for multicultural primary healthcare workers and chronic diseases. Um, and that all sounded really exciting at the time and, you know, we all got involved and it completely petered out because there was no career pathway, mm. okay? So there was no point doing this certificate because all you ever were going to do is do one-off casual projects. And so unless it all comes together as part of an integrated sort of strategy, um, you know, it, it is part, it's an important platform on which to build, but we need to do more than just the training ships. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have yeah. other plans, Rachel. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know that. Um, so we're going live to Sydney. Um, to uh, Michelle Humans, who is from our sister peak in New South Wales, the Mental Health Coordinating Council, which in itself is a training organisation, unlike us. They offer the Certificate for in Mental Health Peer Work as a traineeship. And so we're going to hear more from Michelle about that, who is the Learning and Development Manager. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you so much. And good morning, everyone. Lovely to be with you via Zoom. Uh, I caught a little bit at the end of that panel discussion, so my apologies if anything I say is a little bit repetitive. Um, but I really do want to take an opportunity as the sister peak to QAMH to share around how we can be improving workforce capability and sustainability through the delivery of traineeships by sharing a bit of what MHCC has experienced. So a little bit of context, we have been delivering traineeships through our state training authority uh, since 2015. We do, as has already been mentioned, we deliver the certificate for in mental health peer work, but also the certificate for in mental health. Um, important to note that we also have a range of scholarships and entry pathways for both existing workforce and new people that we're trying to attract to our sector. Uh, so we also provide scholarships and um, fee-for-service as well. And I think another key uh, point to raise is that MHCC's approach to traineeships and accredited training more generally has really been in, the, in response to what our landscape of the workforce looks like here in New South Wales. So for us, we were first involved in um, developing and advocating for the development of a peer work qualification 
And when that got through in 2014-2015, uh, one of the key things we saw was that there were a lot of people who were already employed in the industry who either were looking to get some vocational recognition, who wanted to do a qualification, and then there were a whole bunch who didn't want to do a qualification, particularly in our lived experience or peer workforce where lived experience can, can be viewed and is viewed as a, a form of expertise in and of itself. Uh, so our, our approach has very much been in response to what things have been like in our landscape. Uh, really in terms of increasing workforce sustainability and reducing barriers, that's what we try to focus on with any training that we're delivering. Um, so I don't want to go too much into detail, I guess, around what traineeships are. I'm, I'm um, guessing that some of that has already been covered, but just briefly, really it focuses around the vocational skilling. So it's for new entrants, so people that were wanting to attract to our workforce or our sector or existing workers. One of the challenges that we've found is that uh, traineeships need to happen within the first three months of someone being employed. In New South Wales, a lot of people, particularly who were mental health workers and mental health peer workers, had already been employed well beyond that three-month mark. So the option for traineeships was no longer on the table for that. So we then had to explore some other, other pathways. It is typically one to two years in length for full-time trainees, but the um, person themselves can be employed either as part-time, full-time or casual the traineeship itself, though, in terms of the study, can't be a casual uh, load. It has to be either part-time or full-time. Um, and it is competency-based training, which is what we have our own training uh, organisation here at MHCC. Um, so skills and performance matter more than the time that is served. So what it also enables us to do is it recognises existing skill sets, um, even if they're not exactly, you know, word for word, um, we can do things around sort of looking at the skill sets and the knowledge that someone brings and being able to map that according to a recognition of prior learning process. Um, the purpose for us with traineeships has really been around trying to get that balance of people who are already employed or want to be employed, of matching those, uh, the knowledge and the information and the theory that they might learn in a qualification with real skills in their workplace. And that provides a wonderful opportunity for what we call contextualization. So some of the assessments or the work that someone might be doing, we can actually mirror to include language or the skills or the types of activities they're actually doing in real time in their workplace. So it becomes less of a um, sort of idea just, you know, in someone's mind and really links to what they're actually doing. Uh, they do get paid, which is always a benefit as well in terms of uh, retaining people. And ideally, it really increases that connection to industry. That is what vocational education and training is all about. It's not to just get a qualification. It's so that skills and knowledge can really link to what the real work and, and skills actually looks like. So we have definitely seen some benefits for traineeships uh, in terms of providing structure. There's some buy-in for all stakeholders as well. We tend to see a higher student completion rate when the training is delivered face-to-face -face rather than online. Uh, there tends to be increased workplace support, not always, uh, which can contribute to preventing stress and burnout, especially for our designated peer workforce. Uh, or lived experience workforce and those who supervise, manage, work alongside of them. Um, and for us, we have a contract through our state training authority, which means we have no cap to the amount of traineeships that we can provide. So that also offers a lot more accessibility for those who would like to, to pursue that path. The other key things that I wanted to focus on were around some of our learnings and I guess then considerations for the draft workforce strategy that um, you're all discussing today. So like I mentioned, most existing workers are not eligible for traineeships. So then it's thinking through what kind of happens with that existing workforce, um, particularly within the lived experience workforce. We have found that a number of people do not necessarily uh, see vocational education as a valuable pathway. 
for them. Again, it is that uh, perspective of lived experience as its own expertise, which is very true, but not necessarily being open to more structured or institutionalised ways of engaging in education. There are also real complexities with being employed, so having a contract and having things that you're needing to be doing in your job, and also having the right to learn, which includes the right to make mistakes. Sometimes when you're aware that you're being employed, meaning that then you're being, um, whether it's a reality or not, you're being observed, your performance is sort of up on the table, it can be really tricky to exercise a right to learn and sort of ask questions when you feel like that may be uh, coming into play in terms of your performance in a paid capacity. Also, it doesn't necessarily lead to um, the trainee being able to demonstrate the skills or get access to the tasks in the workplace that match with the qualification. So there can be an assumption where the position description that someone has automatically will align to the qualification. That's not necessarily the case. And there can be a lot of administrative load as well for the workplace. I did hear, hear um, earlier one of the panel members talking about supervision as well. There is definitely an investment in terms of supervision and, and support from the workplace. Uh, we all know funding requirements, competing priorities around that as well. Um, I won't go into that in too much detail. I'm sure you're all aware. So my consideration is to sort of wrap up from there for you all to, to take away and maybe continue to discuss is whether qualifications for um, our sector, the community mental health sector, is the approach that we would be taking something that that qualification is a requirement or a recommendation for people to have? Is it something that in the approach is kind of embedded, um, for example, where employees can start, but within 12 to 18 months, they need to get this qualification? Uh, difficult if that's not mandated um, or sometimes not difficult. It sort of opens up lots of opportunities. But thinking through, do people need to have that qualification before starting? Do they need to have it at all? Is it a recommendation? Is there then scope within a workplace for someone to work towards that over a period of time? What happens then if they don't get that qualification within that period of time as well? What happens to their employment as a result of that? Uh, what is the landscape of your workforce in Queensland? So do you have a mixture of existing employees who really want to get that vocational recognition? Or are you wanting to create entry opportunities? So really it's around that attracting and retaining workforce into the sector. It might be a combination of both. Uh, the policy landscape, so as is um, in the draft workforce strategy, things around um, the uh, mental health, alcohol, other drugs, suicide prevention strategic plan, the better care together response, the broader Queensland workforce strategy. So the key themes that I see amongst all of those, which we've had to navigate in New South Wales, is really around how do we improve workforce capability and sustainability. Uh, and it's not an easy answer. It's definitely not a one size fits all really key is around resourcing and capacity to implement traineeships. So really thinking through, do you have access to quality and integrous training providers where you are confident that the, the skills qualifications are actually at a, at a point where um, that's going to maintain, I guess, a consistency in terms of the training that people in the sector will receive? Uh, and is there a coordinated approach across the sector? And from my perspective, across peaks as well, uh, we last night um, had our AGM at MHCC and we launched our recent workforce report. I know QAMH also has one that they've released in October. The um, reports across peaks tend to show really similar themes nationally. So we all see similar workforce um, themes or demographics and we're all struggling with really similar things so how can we take a really well thought out and coordinated approach that doesn't just fit as a blanket but still meets individual and location-based um, key unique experiences but also is not separate from one another and the last point that I wanted to, to leave on was around organisational readiness. And this is not just in terms of the peer workforce or lived experience workforce, 
What we found at MHCC is that there is a mix between why people don't complete traineeships. Sometimes it's that that student leaves the role or they're struggling with accredited training and they're just, despite the amount of support, it's just not something that they're willing to continue. The other side of that coin is around the organisation and the workplace. So it's around capacity, it's around support, it's around the resources, um, it's around does the organisation actually understand what a traineeship is and the purpose of it? Do they actually have a clear position description for that trainee? Do they have a professional development plan, a wellbeing plan for those with lived experience that is done in collaboration rather than just a this is what needs to happen? Uh, is there adequate supervision from someone that has the skills that directly link to that qualification? Uh, that's really the other key part that I think feeds into improving workforce ca capability and sustainability. For a lot of us on the ground, uh, there's a lot of competing priorities. We're often resource limited, um, but we've got to be thinking through strategically as well how we can be contributing at times to some of that lack of sustainability and retention of the workforce. Uh, so traineeships are definitely one pathway. I would agree with the um, final panel speaker who shared earlier that it's one pathway. It's definitely not a one size fits all, um, but hopefully those considerations are, are helpful in, in thinking through the strategy. Thank you, Michelle. Have we got time for any questions from Michelle? Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Do we have any questions? Not at the moment. Maybe from our panel. Is there? Do we need to? Got got nothing more to add uh, in for myself anyway. Uh, but just an observation, if I could. Yeah. I keep looking up that workforce shortages poster up there. <laughs> <laughs> I look away from it. In terms of traineeships and, and looking at um, uh, you know, services in, in the rural, remote and regional areas, um, I'm a firm believer that no matter what organisation you are, traineeships are a great stepping stone into a pathway of a career. And it's got to be supported and nurtured by the organisation as well to help that, uh, that, uh, that individual through that journey. I was reflecting back on a, on a, on a, on a situation we had because we've got to be quite flexible and quite nimble in, in, in regional remote because we've got a very, very finite uh, uh, pool of resources. I remember taking on a, a, um, a staff member and put him in a traineeship who then went on and completed the traineeship in that particular, that was business at that particular time, was interested in business. Um, had, wanted to have a, ch a change of career because they thought, I oh, actually quite like allied health. I might have a look and um, see if I can see and, and start a pathway into allied health. I said, all right, that sounds like a really good idea. Are you interested in a, um, um, a, a pathway into that before you make a decision to go into university and became an allied health assistant? and work with our clinical team uh, for, a, for a good two years and then made a decision thereafter to further that qualification. So in an area where we're talking about a high turnover of staff, I had that, uh, that, that employee uh, within our organisation lean developing for about four to five years. And we've got a turnover of, 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 of 13, 14, 15 months. That's a pretty good start and that all came by way of a traineeship. So there's, there's positives in that and that's mm. I think is in, is in general for all organisations. Fantastic. And thank you, Michelle. We might let you go, but thank you for your considered um, uh, contribution for today. You've given us quite a lot to think about in terms of traineeships. Um, and we absolutely take the point that people need a whole range of different ways that suit them to, to get to where they need to get to. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, so um, training is one thing, but how do we attract and keep people? There are some clear fixes we need. Um, for a start, we need contracts and funding that allow us to make employment conditions much more attractive. Um, and uh, so some of those ideas are real, have really been around um, another layer of support, particularly in regional and remote areas and so that might be you know what's been suggested is things like loading for organizations or individuals to attract individuals um, 
relocation payments, accommodation support. So in our consultation, um, we heard in some of the regional areas that we went to that they could get the people, but the people couldn't find the housing when they got there, so they couldn't actually take the job. So a real problem. Um, I will ask the panel in a little while a, a bit about that and what we might need to do to support the growth of the workforce in regional and remote areas. Um, but we do have another idea and we're going to invite Rita to come up and talk about that idea. Okay. Thank you so much for um, inviting me just to say a few, just to speak for a few minutes. I guess when we first got involved in the development of this workforce strategy and we had a specific dedicated sort of workshop um, together with QPAST and, and sort of staff working in a multicultural space. And I guess the plea at that, from that workshop was very much about um, don't reduce us to a paragraph at the end of the strategy, which we normally end up being under special needs. Um, so um, credit to the team really took on board, I guess, what we said. And it's been really heartening to read your workforce strategy and to see, um, I guess, the issues for what you've sort of called specific health worker. Um, I guess we like to think of it more as specialist uh, multicultural, specialist um, mental health workers because working, I guess, with specific priority population groups, it does take specialist skills. Um, and so that often isn't recognised. Um, we are very much always reduced to just language and culture. Um, and it's so much more complex than that. Um, we've actually got, um, we did a sh really short explainer video, which only goes for about one and a half minute, which I thought I could show, um, show if that's okay. Can we show that now? Um, because it says it's so much better than what I can in a few minutes. So we might just, if there's someone here who can press the right button. As a world wellness group, multicultural peer support worker, it is your lived experience that really helps improve health outcomes for the people you work and care for. It also helps reduce the inequality and injustice within the mainstream national health and mental health care system. Your lived experience is a powerful voice. A lived experience is the knowledge and understanding you get when you have lived through something. Without a full representation and voice of the whole population, health services will continue to leave people behind. By focusing on the lived experience of people from multicultural backgrounds, together we can work for change so that those healthcare needs are properly met, rather than having to fit those needs into what is already available. That is why your work as a multicultural peer support worker is so valuable because you will be there at the heart of change, bridging the gap. Through your language, your culture, your migration experience, your settlement experience, your acculturation experience, your experience with health services, your own lived experience. It is the most important and powerful tool you have to help your peers to enable reform through one-to-one -one support roles, forums, advisory groups, in education, advocacy, health services and outcomes will become better for everyone. Thank you for being there as a World Wellness Group Multicultural Peer Support Worker. Great. <laughs> Thank you. So this sort of, I guess, is very much aligned with, I guess, some of the recommendations in the workforce strategy about more awareness and language that we use. And you can see what we've done here is really broaden the definition of lived experience to talk to people from multicultural backgrounds because, as we know, so much of their mental health and well-being is so socially determined. So really bringing in those social determinants and that migration and settlement experiences into those experiences, we hope to then really, I guess, appeal to people and speak to people and do this work. And I guess, um, you know, I sort of feel like I can only really talk about the multicultural peer support workforce because that's my area of expertise. But I know there are probably so many common principles that anyone who works with groups that are minoritised and marginalised that we do really have to put cultural safety, you know, cultural tailoring um, at the forefront of the work that we do. Um, and so I think that... Um, 
and in our work, anti-racism. So I feel like those are all the things that we often don't get to talk about, but they're really important in our work. So I feel this little video is really about our why, you know, our why and our what. And I just, I guess I want to just take one minute just to finish off on the how, like how are we going to do this? So we've started to talk about traineeships. And like I said um, before, for us, it's really about a pathway, you know, to actually have professional recognition that these type of roles are professional roles. They have a career pathway. They are a really important part of everything that we need to do. Um, and they're basically um, flexibility with the on-the-job training, really having those industry partnerships. Like I think, if I think about our workforce, like they could be doing so much more on-the-job training and support if we have those partnerships with training providers and working together. Like I think we could do more in that space. And I think um, the last one is really enough to put my glasses on, sorry, because um, I took some notes. And I, I think the last one really comes down to sort of I guess our models of service, you know, that our models of service, it's not only for those of us who work in specialist services, but it's the whole community mental health sector, really thinking about our models of service and being more culturally inclusive. It's not one or the other, it's both. We need to coexist together, you know, like all services need to be culturally inclusive and responsive. But then for some people in our population, they do need specialist services. And it's about how we all work together. And I guess my final comment is that Multicultural is mainstream. Um, you know, last census, 51% of the population is overseas born. We are a multicultural country. That is now mainstream. So let's all do more work together to make that a reality. Thank you. So I might take that back to our panel. The, the issue of specialist... Uh, me mental health workers, because we've heard that from a range of specialties as well, um, LGBTIQ+, um, you know, we, I know we've, there's probably someone from Peachtree in yeah. the audience somewhere. Yeah, so there's kind of a range of specialties we could be developing. We also hear from some of our colleagues that we need specialist drug and alcohol peer workers and um, in the suicide prevention space as well. Catherine, what's your take on that? Yeah, so I think I think we need to be very... Uh, we need to become increasingly specific at times around what lived experience is because we, we used to say lived experience back in the day and it always referred to individuals who had serious mental illnesses who had used public mental health services. But as that's grown and shifted, it started to mean um, and expand and mean all kinds of things but we don't articulate it very well. So my inner researcher totally freaks out. Um, the way that we should be saying this is lived experience of, and I would say describe myself of mental distress and personal recovery. And I would say for my parents that they have a lived experience of providing care, support and of being family. But I think that there are distinctions around uh, who knows what about what things as well. So even though as a group of people who have experienced mental distress, we might have some commonalities, in certain times for certain people in certain services, we might need more specific kinds of knowing and experience because other kinds might not really understand or be able to answer the question. So two spots for that, think roses of the ocean, is suicide. So, um, so for me, for my lived experience... I can comment on public mental health, serious mental illness, stigma and discrimination, but I do not have the lived experience of accessing services or of, of being in danger of completing suicide. It's outside of my lived experience, so my lived experience doesn't really cover that. Another space where my lived experience might be partially helpful but not specifically helpful is um, within eating disorders. Eating, People with working within lived experience of eating disorders have had very different experiences from me, know very different things and understand the service system very differently. And if I was to do focused lived experience eating disorder work, I would want people who have the experience to do that. Sometimes we expand it out a little bit further and we start to look at it in terms of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander lived experience. And then I would... Um, and then I, I still want to know if it's their lived experience of their, their culture and identity and their being. But I also still want to know if it's for mental health sometimes as well because it just tells us I me mean, more specifically if people can give me information so I can understand their information. And it's the same with culturally and linguistically diverse or multicultural perspective. 
Um, I think multicultural workers in when I was back in the day when I was a worker um, were really underutilised and under-recognised. Um, and I would like to see greater representation of our multicultural and our other ways of knowing, being and getting together to solve problems. So I have this constant thing that I talk about in department meetings and things because I'll get in there and it will be um, eight, eight white women and then two white guys and no one will speak, have any, um, any experience of speaking any other languages or have any strong cultural connections or cultural safety information that they can first-hand bring. And I'm just sitting there in this meeting one day, I'm like, I don't think other people solve problems like this because we're all around a table. And I'm like, <laughs> I don't, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not surprised that we're not getting to the heart of this because I don't think we're even asking and solving and approaching questions in a way that other people would want to come to. Um, so for me, that's where I see the fundamental shift and being more specific in the context with which we're working about what kind of experiences we need. And, and to follow on, Catherine, as an academic too, do you train all of those specialties differently or is there... How, how, I, do we, how do we make that happen is just a small question. I think question. it needs to come... <laughs> I think in lived ex my lived experience answer is that it needs to come from the people who have that lived experience. So you need to get around the people who are, who have this and who know their culture because they'll just say, no, you can't do it that way. And, you know, this is what's great about asking real people or don't no, do it, let's do it this way or, you know, so because I feel like other cultures would just say there's no way you can just have a meeting round a table and randomly invite people who have never been, who have never met and have this piece of paper with five things that have already been decided mm -hmm. and you're going to solve the problems. It sounds like a fundamental misunderstanding of what's here. And like we were talking about before, multicultural is mainstream. It's most of us. Um, and, you know, it's so funny. After that meeting where I'm like, I don't think people would even come to this, um, which is a brave thing to say in a department meeting. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I went to bloody South Bank and because um, it was about social prescribing stuff and they couldn't understand why someone from Box Hill is, has the most um, people of Chinese origin in Melbourne in that one suburb and the, and they couldn't understand how they couldn't get people from who were speaking all the different Chinese languages into their centre and there was all, oh, sorry, all white people. And then I went to South Bank and I was going to something else completely different and there was a table tennis table. And there was people um, from clearly like um, Chinese descent playing ping pong. You had to bring your own bat, you had to bring your own ball. People were committed. But that's all it took to bring people together was to reflect back an opportunity for them to engage into something that they wanted to do. And it didn't need, didn't need to be occupied, it was in a public space. But mm. I just think we... We're so used to doing it in such an Anglo-Saxon way that people get left out and we don't even ask them how they'd want to come. Mm. I think yeah. we've all been to those meetings, Catherine. I think I can, just a couple. I, I can think of a few. And so, John, for a, a, from a rural and remote perspective, what are the challenges of, around, um, you know, multicultural specialties and all the other specialties you might know? Oh, I think... Well articulated. I think no matter where you if you're in in Brisbane metropolitan, the the, the same the same lens to a large extent, but just probably in a different uh, context uh, in in real remote. Uh, it's all about uh, for, for for my for my lens is is about uh, listening, uh, understanding, being available, and uh, and, and being uh, seen as a as an inclusive and trustworthy or, or trusting organisation, uh, and, and a trusting network to help support. Whatever the the, uh, the barriers are, whatever the needs are, it takes time. It takes engagement. It takes um, it takes going back, developing those relationships, and um, listening again, assisting, and uh, and and as time progresses, um, more awareness, more comfortability, and and, uh, and more access to services become from come from it. Mm. Yeah. Can I just add on on top of that as well? Two other places we exclude other cultures and other languages. You now in um, usually our pamphlets and usually in our outcome measurement tools. So if you can't offer outcome measurement tools in a range of different languages, you can't measure it. Mm. Mm. Rita, any last comments about what you've heard? 
Um, yeah, no, I think just picking up on your point, the issue of data and outcome measures and so on, I think is what's really hindered a lot of development. We just mm. haven't really had um, the data um, journey from Queensland Health. And I was just joking before, because we both um, have been, were involved in the long crusade <laughs> to get ethnicity collected in Queensland Health, uh, which finally actually recently happened. So maybe there'll be some great data um, in the future. But um, look, I think um, in mental health, I guess I just want to really, I guess, remind us that um, from a multicultural perspective, um, the culture-based models are really important because of the different perceptions and understanding and health beliefs that mm -hmm. are across cultures. And we really do need to think about our models of service and recognising that because otherwise we'll always be at odds with each other and, you know, people won't engage, people will disengage because they won't feel heard or understood or you know, sort of engage really, because that's a big issue, you know, like if we look at where people are in the system, um, people are, well, with every report you pick up, under-representation of the multicultural population in mental health services, if you delve into that, over-representation at the acute end of the mental health system. Yeah. Um, and so there's a whole range of reasons for that, and it's, you know, I think it's all of us in the community-based sector that can really turn that around, um, and it takes all of us to work collectively to do that. Beautiful. Yeah. Well Thank you. Right, should we get these guys to sit in the chairs at the yes. front? So so can I just Sorry, get you? Can I yes. <laughs> Quick. Yes. Um, I was just curious about those conversations and just um, about that specialty area. And I think, Rita, one of the things that we're finding more and more in the multicultural space is you know, the difference between those who have moved here and those who have gone through an immigration process or mm. trauma, yep. um, and that is a different group, and we group it yep. all up together, but yep. we don't kind of recognise the difference. Yep. And the same, I would say, in the LGBTQ plus, where we've got areas where, for instance, young trans people who um, are much more traumatised and have much more risk of suicide mm. and all of those that we're not addressing. So while we break things down, there's then even further groups within those groups that are we are seeing at the acute end, but we're not seeing in community service delivery, like mm. in peer support or um, community service. And the more specialist it is, the more important it is to have someone with that experience in the room. So I, I just thought yeah, I'd no, thank that. you for that. Great comment. Thanks. Yeah. We're going to have a bit of fun to keep you all on your toes. So I might get the three of you to sit in the front seats. We're, you know, we're on the final stretch, so, you know, we're just going to do something a bit exciting. Um, and coming off the back of the discussion about needs in our multicultural and diverse community, we're going to dance it out with Bring a Plate Dance School.
Then live li stream was turned off then, wasn't it? <laughs> Not sure. <laughs> Well, we'll send the video around later. Yeah. Um, wow. Woo I'm just stunned at the small places they can dance. Um, that is absolutely fantastic. Thank you. Hopefully that's woken us up for the next bit. <laughs> I'm glad it's Melanie and not me. Who has to follow that? <laughs> Sorry, I don't mean to laugh. Um, so Kathy would have loved to have been here today, but you know it was Italy, or you know. Um, so Melanie's been acting chair for for I don't know about a month now, isn't it? Yeah. Um, uh, so uh, just so that you don't have to hear me speak for the whole day too, uh, Mel Melanie's going to take us through some of the system enablers. Yeah, that's a really hard act to follow. Um, yeah, so how do we go from dancing to talking about this? Well, you know, the third pillar of the strategy is arguably the most crucial because, as the name suggests, system enablers, uh, that these reforms will make all of the other measures possible. I think we've got a little slideshow. Yes, we do. So the first priority targets resourcing. Uh, and so this is what we need. Uh, we need increased contract uh, lengths of five years, minimum state and federal funding. We need contracts with enough lead time to keep our workforce and to plan ahead. And we need flexibility to adapt to the local workforce to better serve our local communities. And we need funding that reflects the true cost of providing a service for training staff and evaluating programs. So think of the difference that that would make. Just being able to offer longer contracts to people, ensuring stability of our services and for the people that use them. What a better outcome for everyone that would be. So the other initiative I'd like to highlight is the embedded, embedded lived experience within and across all levels of organisations because we value lived experience. Because we know the insights and ex expertise of people with lived experience is, is essential to improving the lives, lives of people who use our services. So to do this, we need recognition and contracts to put into practice state and federal workforce guidelines. We believe there should be advanced practice tertiary courses in lived experience and pathways within organisations for lived experience actually to move into leadership roles. I hope this strategy will be implemented as a service provider. I can see how these measures would allow for future planning security for our board, staff, and ultimately our participants. We could keep staff longer and not lose them to the government or private sector. And more staff with a lived experience in a variety of roles. And finally, we could actually focus on service delivery rather than constantly this game of funding and service agreements. Oh, and we could focus more on people. So thank you. Thanks, Melanie. Um, so this is our final panel session before we um, uh, have our last speaker and, and then head off to lunch. Um, so perhaps you could think about embedding, I think we're all in agreement about the funding stuff, are we not? But could we have a bit of a think about how do we embed lived experience at, at, in all parts of the system? I'm looking at you, Catherine, to perhaps kick us off. That was gonna be uh, <laughs> amazing. Look, you know, I think, you know, Wellways is a great example of a contemporary organisation, a community mental health organisation who is very intentionally and deliberately um, structuring lived experience throughout um, all of its line chart and organisational charts. So I report straight to one of the directors. Um, so that's as, as high up as we can go um, at the moment. Um, um, although um, other organisations are... are 
in Victoria also having lived experience directors, so it goes all the way up to the top. So the first thing is a structural issue, which is a commitment to knowing that that is a good and helpful thing to do and putting it formally all the way up. That means that um, under me, for example, sits a lived experience leadership team. This leadership team is an organisationally oriented leadership team. So we have the coordinator for the peer cadets, for example, and we have other people that help us to implement and develop organisation-wide things that we will use and that they are overseen not by someone who might just miss the point or not see it or not get it at the last moment but who can who is overseen by someone who has lived experience and can provide significant professional mentoring for them at the same time and peer supervision so the the first step part of that question is how do we do that we make sure that it's integrated all the way up to the top and that it's supported all the way up to the top what I think works well at Wellways is that there's a lot of authorising of lived experience in that I don't have to um, beg and plead and go around to a million people to make changes. My role is understood to have some cap a lot of capability and to trust to make those changes and to take us in the right direction. The next part that you need, I think, on, on top of that is your, your peer supervision and your mentoring. Um, and you also need that to keep people in the job longer because that's how we burn out and that's how we don't develop as workers and then get really frustrated and stuff like that as well and then you need to be supporting your peer workforce. But if we're looking this at, looking at this across a, a whole community mental health organisation, it's not just thinking that your peer workers are your only lived experience workers, it's about making sure that they are gorgeously supported and they have pathways to grow and occupational pathways as well. So becoming senior peer workers and then from senior peer workers, having development and opportunities to go into different parts of the organisation. Um, we need to remunerate appropriately. We need to have the same conditions. We need to make sure that we're reasonably flexible. Um, it's a bit of a misnomer that people with lived experience take more or are at risk of having more uh, sick leave and things like that. Um, that's not true. We need to kind of do some myth busting around there. Um, Lou Byrne and Helena Ronenfeld, who are actually from Queensland and they wrote the national guidelines, they did the Queensland guidelines for peer as well and they're two friends of mine. They've given some really good guidelines around things like um, culture change and culture shift in organisations because if you don't quite get it and you don't quite understand it, it then things just get lost at the last moment. The other thing is recognising the degree to which your organisation probably has lived experience already embedded in it, even though it's not in a designated role. So if something that has lived experience in it, um, you know, it's fifty, it's about forty-five percent um, lifetime prevalence of mental distress of some form or another across Australia. So nearly everybody has this to some degree, but then it's about for those who are working in identified roles, making sure that they are supported to do it in a what we would call a discipline-focused way. So you understand yourself you understand others, and then you understand yourself within the social and political movement that's lived experience. Beautiful. Yeah. So, so, John, from an organisational point of view, what kind of support do you think organisations are going to need to, to embed lived experience? Uh, that's a very good question and well articulated. I, you know, there's a lot. Of, there's a lot in that. There's a lot. Uh, Sorry. And it is. It, and, and it is absolutely a, a cultural um, a, a change alignment. Uh, and some of many organisations are on the beginning of that journey, and some are, have had have had it for a long time with already embedded. So, um, you know, we're all in different parts of our journeys towards uh, lived experience in in, in our organisations. Uh, but it has to be a top uh, top down bottom up approach. It has to be um, you know running through the organisation uh, and, and and breathing through the organisation uh, at all elements for the support uh, to achieve um, you know the outcome that we're all trying to achieve in terms of lived experience uh, engagement with um, the organisation service delivery uh, activities. Um, I really don't have much more to add on that in, ter in okay. terms of that, that thinking. I'm, I'm, I'm mm -hmm. running it through my mind. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we, for an organisation perspective, are actually uh, at, the, uh, at the front end of that because uh, the services that we've been providing for a number of years um, 
uh, are very clinical focused. They, they, they are clinical, they are, are contract driven. Uh, and to, to bring in people into an organisation um, to help develop and to bring that, um, that through the organisation um, needs to have an investment to a large extent to, mm. um, to help the organisation as well as the clients receiving the service from the organisation uh, achieve that outcome. So uh, certainly the, the funding has to be there to support it, um, whilst organisations can also bring into their organisation from a, um, a, a working activity, um, it, it has to sort of well uh, augment itself well with both funding and support from, from within and also uh, from external. Um, Rita, so uh, I don't know if you can answer this question, but mm -hmm. I'm going to ask it anyway. Mm -hmm. how, how do you think, what, how do you tackle that culture, do you think, that you need? Because you talked, John, about a cultural change. Mm. How, how do we do that? I guess the organisation needs to have it as part of its major, like a strategy, like it's part of your strategic plan, right? So it's part of your doing how you do business. So it's got to be led. Um, and supported and resourced and just reflecting, I guess, on our journey, um, as I said before, um, you know, sort of have 10 years now of trying to build up, sort of, you know, doing better around lived experience in our organisation um, and how we've had to make that shift from just being service delivery focused to the capability development, the reflection, the shift. So the first thing that we did was we developed our own multicultural lived experience framework um, and that came about because some of, I guess, the existing ones, um, they were great. They were sort of the bones of what we needed, but it needed to speak to our workforce of multicultural lived experience workers. So they, and so we had in turn, so we had to basically self-fund it, resource it, drive it and support it. But I guess that was really, you know, sort of the platform on which we are now building. So that little video was part of developing that multicultural lived experience framework but it takes organizational leadership and prioritization to keep and it's a it's an ongoing journey it's just not something you do and then you've got it um, you just got to keep investing in it and we talk very openly about working in the system and on the system so talking about system enablers you know that's sort of a mantra in our organization yes we deliver health services mental health services but simultaneously we have to work on the health system to make it more equitable and multicultural lived experience is central and at the forefront of all that work. So, yeah, it takes a, a culture shift in the organisation. Beautiful. And can I just add a quick yeah. thing, because often clinical really struggle with this, that our, our, principal, our principal, I think, priority um, always is our participants. So... I think even if we don't have lived experience workforce to interface, getting that feedback and listening to our staff about what participants are saying and whether they like what we do or it takes too long or it's too boring or we don't like staff, I think is still Pretty important, yeah. maybe the basic lever I, yeah. I missed. Thanks. Yeah. Beautiful. Um, can I uh, thank all of our panel members uh, today? I think it's been great to have all of your perspectives. So if you could join me in thanking you. Um, so bringing this strategy to life requires a lot of different levers being pulled in different areas of our sector and in the broader mental health sector and across governments, state and federal. Uh, one particular part of the state government that's crucial uh, to the progress is the department responsible for training employment under Minister Di Farmer. Now we've met uh, Di Farmer a couple of times. So she's well aware of this work and she was sorry she couldn't be here today. She's in Hobart, I believe. Um, but she has sent someone to, to give us some thoughts about our strategy and, um, you know, from, from the uh, education and training uh, uh, perspective. Um, so could you please welcome Deputy Director of Engagement, Chantal Laura, um, to come and give us a bit of feedback about our strategy. Thank you, everyone. And I was here for that dance break and, wow, I still feel a little uh, like I don't quite know whether I should be dancing or, or talking. Um, I'd like to first off acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging for they hold the memories, the traditions, the culture and the hope of Australia's First Peoples. 
I'm grateful to join you today. Um, as said, Minister Farmer really wanted to be here. Um, I'm the Deputy Director General for the department and I have a, a range of responsibilities across the workforce portfolio. Um, and she asked me to convey her very well wishes and her, her deep regard for the strategy that's, um, that's been launched. With the pressures of modern life and the overcoming of stigma around mental health, we know that there is an increasing demand for those workforce services. We know that around half of Queenslanders will experience a mental illness at some point in their life. Helping people to positively manage their mental health is important for our communities and for the continued economic prospects of our state. The Australian Government's National Mental Health Commission has laid out a strong economic case for investing in prevention and promotion services. Good mental health delivers huge benefits to the workforce, participation, productivity and economic competitiveness. Having appropriate support in place, delivered by passionate, highly skilled professionals, is about the greater good for the greatest number of Queenslanders. Other social assistance services, which includes welfare support workers, social workers and counsellors, employs more than 103,000 Queenslanders. For perspective, that's a workforce larger than the population of the Bundaberg LGA. Jobs Queensland's most recent Anticipating Future Skills five-year employment projection has total employment in Queensland above 2.9 million by 2025-26, and that's an increase of over 206,000 jobs. New data shows us that more than 70% of all new jobs by 2025-26 will be in five industries, with healthcare and social assistance leading the way. Healthcare and social assistance will experience the largest job growth, that's of 16.4% in the five years. The other social assistance services industries, which includes jobs related to mental health and wellbeing, is projected to grow by 30%. 30, 30 That's over 118,000 jobs. Since 2019, we've invested more than $5.7 million in qualifications directly related to mental health, including a certificate for in mental health, a certificate for in mental health peer work, and mental health peer work skill set. Last financial year, almost 600 st new students were enrolled in these qualifications. In June, we opened consultation on the new Queensland Vocational Education and Training Strategy, what we might be have heard before, it's called QVET. This new strategy will drive the Queensland Government's investment in skills and training, which is worth $1.2 billion. It ensures that the VET sector delivers the kinds of skills the industry wants right now and will also need more into the future. We're currently finalising the strategy and it's due for release in the next few weeks. This new VET strategy also sits under the landmark Good People, Good Jobs Queensland Workforce Strategy, released just over a year ago. The action plan includes several initiatives supporting the mental health and wellness sector. Under the Workforce Strategy, we've established a Workforce Connect Fund to increase investment in industry and community-led projects which address workforce shortages. We've also established a network of industry-based workforce advisors to work directly with small to medium employers to help them address workforce challenges. And we're really pleased that we have both Checkup Australia and CSIA as our IWAs for the sector. We're also partnering with the health and community <coughs> services sector to create and implement sector-led workforce development, attraction and retention strategies. To support this work, Jobs Queensland has recently overseen the establishment of the Queensland Care Consortium. The consortium is a partnership between Jobs Queensland, Checkup Australia, the CSIA, QCOS and the Services Union. The consortium supports the development and delivery of industry-led, government-enabled activities to drive workforce development across the health and community services sector. I just want to mention one final uh, initiative that we have in place, because I think we can all agree that when we talk about growing our workforce, school-to-work transitions is critically important. The Gateway to Industry Schools program, it's the GIST program, is a key industry engagement strategy which builds partnerships between schools and the industry to educate young people about potential career pathways that may be available to them. Health and community services are two of those 11 key sectors that we support. There are 67 health gateway schools and 49 community services gateway schools. Around 40% of them are in regional Queensland for both programs. More than 1,600 students participated in the projects last year for just those two sectors alone. 
no matter where I travel and I travel throughout Queensland very regularly, whenever I go to a school, I always go to one of those schools that have a GIST program because it is incredible to me to see how much it generates enthusiasm and interest from school kids, particularly within those that health sector, community sector. They always have these amazing um, products that people can interact with and get to know and it really does make a difference in that transition from people who are in school and wondering what their next career path will be and actually getting a taste and idea of what what the sector could involve. Finally onto the community health uh, and wellbeing workforce strategy which is why we're here. As with the Queensland workforce strategy it's really encouraging to see the commitment to local solutions building capacity for workers in the regions and establishing local traineeships. The strategy is a really strong example of delivering a framework that industries and sectors can build upon and leverage to respond to their specific workforce needs. I've always believed that the core principle of any good workforce strategy should be that strategic workforce responses are sector-led, they're community-centred and they're government-enabled. So I encourage everyone to think about this principle when looking at implementing this strategy so we can all ensure that it's continued success. Thank you again for inviting me here. I apologise again, I am not the minister, but um, I, I, I do, I, I can't say enough how much that she regrets not being here and, and how much of a commitment she has to the sector and to overcoming workforce shortages that we know are both here now and are here for us in the future. I really look forward to seeing how this strategy will shape the future of the industry and serve the wellbeing of all Queenslanders. Thank you all. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Chantel. Um, so we're nearly at the end of our session today and what we need next is your feedback because as we said, this is a draft we're launching. Um, we. Uh, at our lunch with the Minister on Wednesday, she did promise we could have the launch on the lawn at Parliament House. I feel an announcement coming on. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so what we need is your feedback by the 15th of January. Um, the QR code will take you to the report on the website. You will also find the core competency framework there. So um, we also want feedback about that as well by the 15th of January so that we can um, get to a point of launching the final version in February as planned. Um, so a couple of thank yous from here. Um, thank you, Emma and Alicia, who have been living and breathing this event for several weeks, yes. Um, and, and in fact, the whole team at the Alliance. It was a little tense yesterday afternoon, yeah. I have to say. But I don't know what you're talking about, <laughs> <laughs> But they've all done a fabulous job. And one of the things we tell new employees who come into our office is... There are times when we all need to pitch in and I think we do that really well at the Alliance. So thank you so much to the team. So come and join us for lunch on the terrace and, sorry, uh, uh, Aishley. I just want to say that I really want to ask because it has been so much about embedding what we're doing here. Maybe I, I added this in the report. Important, but getting the employees excited about yeah. We in fact had that conversation at the board yesterday, didn't we, um, about a board position and and that perhaps there are people uh, even within our organisation that do have a lived experience already. Yeah. take that to the board, shall we, um, Melanie? Thank you, Ashley, for that. Shall we have lunch? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you.